<laughs> okay, good morning. Um, <laughs> is everybody okay? <laughs> Um, so this is the the last lecture of the of the course, right? The the, um, the next four lectures will look at how you would design operating systems and what that you know, like try to put together whatever we learned so far. So we're not going to introduce new concepts, um, and I'm going to wrap up with the the security notion here. I'm not going to go into too much detail because that's. That's a separate course by itself, and it's, it's offered in your senior year, right, typically. And, um, so do we have any questions about what we covered so far in, in security or in general? How is the homework project coming along? This project can't be hard, right? <laughs> right. So if you're running into any problems, let me know or I'll send an email to the class. How many of you are choosing the, the lab machines or how many of you are choosing their own machines? How many of you haven't looked at the project at all yet? Okay. For people, what? <laughs> you have to look at it before this weekend, right? Because that's probably what, what we're going to do next, next week. Um, so how many of you are actually using their, their own machines? The rest of them are using the lab machines, I suppose. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't mind people using Windows, just that Windows machines are, are hard to penetrate and figure out what's, what's really going on, right? But if you, if you know how to do it, then it's, it's fine. Right. So I'll, I'll continue with the, with the security notions, right? Um, and like I said, this is, you know, we can't go into the, all the details. But what I want to capture is the notion of what is possible with an operating system, what's the problem with the, with the programs and their bugs, and what is the human aspects of all this stuff, right? Most of, the, most of the bugs are caused by human beings because human beings are, are vulnerable to uh, issues like the phishing we talked about yesterday, right? So, but it, it all gets clubbed into an operating system notion of what security has to be and all those things. So we're trying to find what that would mean without actually going into the security aspects of it, right? So where we left, left off last week was the notion of, last lecture was the notion of viruses and, and what they attack. Essentially, it's, it's one program masquerading as something and, and uh, getting control to you. So if I send you a program and you run it, right, if, I, if you don't run it without any protection with, from the OS, sort of like running within your Java virtual machine or something, right? You are essentially running my program under your protection <coughs> domain. So whatever access you have, that program would have, right? And that can do bad things. And, and, and so that's one way to send viruses. I can send you a program saying, run this program because it's part of your course project and, and essentially take over your machine. So I'm, I'm kind of doing a Trojan house kind of stuff, right? Um, so, on, on this note, there is there is a move within the industry which, which we're not talking about in the class. I, I'll just mention it, right? So one of the, the biggest developments in the recent, recent uh, uh, past is the notion of a data center. How many of you heard of data centers? Right? Few of you, right? So, essentially, companies don't want to run their own operating systems. Companies don't want to run their own machinery. They outsource it to um, certain companies which, which uh, specialize in these kind of constructs. So they build a humongous room or uh, as big a room as, you, as, you, as they could afford and put a whole lot of machines in there and you outsource your machine, you know, your computing to them, right? So for example, Notre Dame can say, we're gonna outsource all our storage to them, we're gonna outsource all our computing to them. So our mail servers will run in them and, and so on and so forth. So you have this one big room where one big room or one big site where there are a whole bunch of computers running for different com uh, companies, right? So it's potentially possible for one room to run the computing for Ford and GM and, and Chrysler competing. The, the companies don't really trust each other, but the machines all run on the same same uh, particular uh, site, right? And that's sort of the future because that, that, that makes a lot of things easier because now you don't have to hire people to manage all these computers and stuff. You can have one, one person do all, all these things. And the other nice thing is you can get machines 
just like that. So if I, if I want 1,000 more machines, if the site had a million machines, right, it's, it's likely to have this 1,000 machines for me on the fly. So if I suddenly um, need computing for whatever reason, you know, if you have a website and you suddenly become popular, then you can, you can deal with those loads, right? So it, it, it kind of aggregates the computing across a whole bunch of companies, a whole bunch of domains and stuff. So like, you know, your AOL and Apple and Yahoo and all those things have humongous data centers. So again, the, the whole issue of trust comes into the picture here because like I said, Ford and GM can be in the same room, they don't trust each other. So how do you make sure that these, these things collaborate with each other, right? So, in a, so one way to do that is to have physically accelerated machines. So you can say, I would partition one third of the machines to do Ford, one third to GM, and one third to Chrysler or what have you. And it's not very flexible because then if suddenly somebody wants more machines, you have to physically go and change the wiring and, 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 and what have you, right? So the, the, the one thing that people are really excited about is the notion of virtualizing. Sort of like what your Java virtual machine does, except you create virtual machines on the fly. We haven't, we didn't go much into that stuff and I'll, I'll try to see if I can squish in a little bit into the, into the last lecture, right? It's, it's sort of like your VMware. Some of you might have used VMware, right? Essentially VMware makes you, makes it look like you have another machine running inside the same machine, right? Or people may use virtual PC within uh, Macintosh, right? So if you run a virtual PC, PC then it creates what looks like a, a Windows PC inside your inside your Mac, and you have to install the operating. It looks like a blank machine, so you have to install the operating system. It boots up and, and runs everything as as a process within your your main machine, right? You have issues with the resource management because that <coughs> OS would be sharing all the resources with the primary machine, right? So if you have one gig of memory and you give 512 to the um, the virtual machine, right? Then you will only have 512 left because it's it's actually a physical entire machine running into here. And it'll also be slow because depending on what you do, you know, it, it, it's it's sharing the whole thing, right? But if you believe the machines are faster, getting faster and stuff, these become more viable, right? So that's that's all the rage right now. Like one of the one of the things that people really like is the um, VMware, which is a company which which builds these kind of sort of things, and uh, Zen, right, which is an open source model, right. So the idea here is, I create a virtual machine. So essentially, your program for your program, it looks like you have your whole machine on to yourself, right. And I can instantiate it basically by running this process over and over again. And so, if you want to do anything bad, sure, go ahead. I mean, you're only affecting your own virtual machine. You don't affect anything else, right. And that's a way to boot up a machine very quickly too, because. Um, I will create a uh, machine image which is ready to go and start that all the time. So it doesn't actually reboot in the, in the, in the, uh, in the typical sense, right? So if you go to data centers, that's what they're trying to do. So essentially they, they, they make one machine look like a couple of machines, give them to different users and stuff. And some of the problems you, you talked about here are not a concern there. If you want to trash a machine, they don't really care because you only trash your virtual machine they can create a new virtual machine. But for normal people who work on a single laptop or single desktop, these kind of a problems are, 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 are bad things. If you're running a, on your, on your um, directly on the machine, so if a virus was where to change the boot sector, right, you're practically host because the, the way the, the system boots up, your firmware gets control, gives it to the boot sector, and it does something before calling an operating system. Right. Your OS does not know anything about the hardware unless the firmware or the boot <coughs> sector tells it what it is. So if, you, if your firmware says you have a 40 gig hard drive, that's what the OS knows. Right? The OS cannot directly find out uh, all these things because it, it, it's not even around when these things are probed. Right? So if you have a boot sector virus, essentially you would lie about everything. So if you say, give me the boot sector, boot sector virus knows that you're asking for a boot sector so it can actually give you the wrong thing. Right? See, it's, it's harder to get rid of them because they lie about everything. So if you find out what the disk space is, now it's smaller. If you try to read the boot sector, it'll actually give you the original sector, even though that's not what is stored, right? But there are other ways to, to bring a machine to its knees, right? So some of the, the stuff you might have heard about, you know, the, the first worm happened in um, 89 uh, time frame, right? Essentially, have these things attack attack different machines. 
post kind of internal <laughs> service attacks and stuff. So if you if you keep looking within OIT, you, you, you get these mails once in a while about how these machines, uh, some machine is attacked and it, it attacks other machines and stuff, right? <coughs> so we're not worried about the security aspects of it. What we're worried about is how it brings down the whole machine and how you manage those things. So the one way for OIT to say stuff is, I won't, we won't let students bring their laptops, right? We will only have OIT uh, administered machines, no student laptops and stuff. And that keeps the system much more secure. The also make for a fairly useless campus, right? How many of you use laptops on a, on a regular basis? And how many of you actually keep it like fully patched up and fully secure and all those things? With no, not opening any ports more than what OIT wants you to open and stuff like that. And you do that because you're malicious or because you want your work done? OIT would like to call it you're malicious, right? And I like to call it work done, right? So, um, so I mean, so those, those are not something that can be wished away. I mean, you cannot say OIT is right or you are right. I mean, there has to be happy medium. But the fact of the matter is you are going to have issues. You are going to have all, this, all, this, all these things to deal with, right? Um, the flexibility comes at the cost of all this stuff. So, so I'm not giving you the security aspect of it because I don't think that's that's what this course is about. Uh, I'm trying to see what what we can do as a OS uh, designer. So even for, so even for the laptop thing, some people advocate that you should not run the real machine on the on your laptop, but run it as a virtual machine, right? So in that way, you won't be host ever, right? So you you, you essentially you're running as a as a virtual machine. So you have one physical machine running one virtual machine where your whole life is, right? So it, it sort of doesn't make sense from a performance perspective, but it makes sense from a protection perspective. So if your machine is uh, trashed, essentially kill the virtual machine, start a new one, and you're good to go, right? So within the, with the so let, let, we'll go through a little bit about what are the different security mechanisms around, and I'll, I'll give you a hint of how, how they, they may be useful, right? One of the ways that they will be useful is to protect some data that, that the OS manages, right? So if you were to, so the, the idea of encryption or, or security is to protect it from prying eyes. So if you want to, if you had a choice of protecting something on your machine, what would you protect? Your hard disk thing contents, your memory contents are, yeah, that's, so would you protect the data which is in the main memory or would you protect the data in the hard disk? Or both? <coughs> Who said both? So who, who wants to go with one or the other? Who wants to go? I guess you are going with both, right? Who? At any given moment or all, like, always? Or? Is that a Yeah, that's, that's the key, right? I mean, the whole OS feel, if there's anything you want to pick up from the class, which is nothing comes free, right? If, yeah, if it came free, then obviously you would want both. You would want it to be encrypted all the time on, this, on, the, on the disk, all the time in memory, and, and everything goes. But it's not the case. So you would want it wherever, wherever you're willing to, uh, to deal with the cost, right? So. Some of the file systems let you encrypt the, the, the disk contents, right? Very few systems let you encrypt the memory contents because if you encrypt the disk contents, every time you do a disk access, it's unencrypted and cached, right? So that's how they can still get some performance by caching all the contents. So if you encrypt the memory itself, you can't have another cache because that, that breaks the whole thing, right? And some of you may have heard about the Microsoft, whatever they call it uh, uh, today, uh, notion of trusted computing, or they they have different names to make the same con construct, right? I mean, if you heard of this this notion of a trusted computing, their their notion is somehow the hardware would enforce that certain applications would be trusted and they will be allowed to run, and they won't be allowed to do certain things, and there'd be these other applications which won't be able to do certain things, right? 
And it's been an ongoing battle for a long time, yeah, both in the technical side and on the practical side of how you implement that, right? So this, these are all hard button items on how, where you want to put it, how you deal with this and all those things. And um, as OS designer, we just kind of go around and, and see what can be done. So if you, do, if you do a security on your hard disk, it's essentially encrypt your hard disk. How many of you have tried to encrypt their hard disk, have a secure hard disk system? Which use in Linux? I did a long time ago with this. Okay. Yeah, Windows and uh, I guess the Mac, Mac and I'll support those stuff, right? So, how come only one person was encrypting the hard disk? Was it the performance that turned people off? Or? Well, I mean, in Windows, especially, it's only secure as your network login. So, if you have a password, you can just run a boot CD and use the password. It really doesn't do anything for you. The speed is so slow that it's kind of, it was kind of pointless. I, th I think what it points to is what, what you're re really saying is all of them is only secu as secure as the key, right? So if I have the key, then encryption makes no difference, right? The other fear is if you lose the key, then your disk is no use to you, right? So you want something which is transparent, and people try really hard to come up with one transparent way. So you, you like the security to be, you just say it's secure now, and it works, right? But it's not the case, and as, as we'll see in the next few slides, there's a notion of a security will have a notion of a key, right, which un unencrypts it, right? So if everybody knows that key, everybody knows your password, all the security has no significance, right? If you forget what the key is, then it's hard to get them back. So a lot of people don't want to um, deal with those issues, right? So there are a lot of, so all, all this again, if you, if you look around what, what OIT and all tells you, you kind of get a sense of what, what, what should be, right? So what do you think is a good password? An easy to remember password or Humongously hard password for you to remember that you have to write it down, right? OIT would say humongously hard one. That you have to write it down, right? And I think that's the general consensus now because I think a few years back everybody thought that simple to remember passwords are the way to go. Right? That you should never write it down, you should have it all in your head kind of thing, right? And that's one of the things I want to see in the, the, in the next lecture. Um, on what that means, right? Like what kind of a security means for what? And for example, my laptop, I don't usually leave it around unless I, you know, something happened to me or something, right? So I, I keep physical track of it. So I don't mind having complicated passwords. I, I hardly log into the machine, right? Or keeping files in there which are encrypted. My my way of computing is different than if I were to use a shared machine, right? So all of these play play. Uh, some sort of a role, right? So anyway, so the, the notion of security is, I don't know if you can read this stuff. So if somebody is, you know, two, two parties are, are communicating, they want to en en encrypt this content so that somebody in the middle can't understand what's, what's being said, right? So simpler, simple form of uh, encryption is, is if you were to talk in Pig Latin. So if you know that I'm talking in Pig Latin, then you can figure out what, what I'm saying, right? But it, if you're using computers, you can make a lot, lot more complex algorithms. You can make algorithms which are harder to break, right? And you want to make sure that the attacker, so you want it to be as strong as what you expect the attacker to attack, right? So if you're going to look at my checking account, right, I don't think anybody's going to spend a million dollars to make, to break into my checking account to take a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars, right? If Citibank is talking to another bank and they're transferring trillion dollars, then they want it to be more secure than what they would want to do uh, with my own stuff. So, so that's that's the thing. So you want to have encryption depending on what you think your threat is, right? And I'm not going to go into the the details of the, the math behind it, but essentially the idea here is you want a, a mechanism where if I send a message to you and if it's encrypted, right? It's easy, it's easy for you to unencrypt if you know what the password is. If you, it's easy for you to figure out what it is if I tell you how to unencrypt it. But it's hard for you to figure out what it is by looking at the string. Right? So you want to make sure, as I said, the end user, it's easy for them to figure out what it is. And it's very hard for the other people to, to figure out what it is. Right? So if otherwise, the system becomes useless because the end user 
even finds it hard to uh, unencrypt it, right? Or if, if it's easy for somebody else to figure out, right? So if I talk in Pig Latin, pretty quickly you'll figure out that we are talking Pig Latin because you can figure out what, what the, the, the sequence by me talking for a while, right? So there are two ways of doing encryption, right? There, there are two fundamental ways of doing encryption. One is a symmetric key one, and the other is asymmetric key. And again, I'm not going to the details. The, the big picture idea is in symmetric key, there is one, one key for both sides of the equation, right? And you, you save that and usually you, you give it through some other means. So this is similar to the spy books and whatnot you've seen in, uh, in, in old movies and stuff, right? So essentially you have one key that we both will end up using, right? And it's, it's, it's as secure depending on, on, the, on the who the key is, right? So that's why you see in the old, old movies you have this, the, the spy book and the, the key book that the hero would go through great pains to save it and all, all those things, right? A simpler case of that is the Pig Latin case I talked about, right? If you, know, I, you and I know that we're talking Pig Latin, then I can talk in Pig Latin, it's easy for me to talk and easy for you to understand in Pig Latin because you know that we're talking in Pig Latin, right? Of course, you won't use it because everybody else can figure out what we're saying if you say a few words, but that's the sort of idea, right? So it's, it's easy to, it's easy on the computation side. The harder part is how do we do the key distribution, which is, which is the, the harder part, which is, the idea is how do I tell you what the password is for you to look at this contents? The other model is the asymmetric uh, key encryption where there is a notion of two keys, right? And one is called a public key, one is called a private key. But essentially there are two keys and you make one of them public and you keep one of them to yourself, right? So this way you can implement a whole bunch of schemes. So it, you can make it such that I can authenticate myself. So I can say it came from me, right? So there are, there are four different things I can do. I can, I can make it such that you know the message came from me. I can make it such that only you can read the message. I can make it such that only I can send it and only you can receive it, right? I guess the fourth one is no encryption, right? So the idea here is everybody knows the public key, only I know my pub, uh, private key and only you know your private key. So if I want to send message, some message that I want to sign, it right, basically says that it comes from me, I essentially sign it with my private key, right? So anybody, since you know the, so essentially if you apply the public key and the private key, you get the original message back, right? You can apply it in either order. You can do it public key, private key, or private key, public key. But essentially if you have both the keys, you know how to open it, right? So if I send a message to you which is encrypted in my private key, since you know my public key, since everybody knows my public key, you, can, you should be able to unencrypt it to see that it was it came from me because only I could have signed it because only I should know my private key, right? If my private key is known to everybody, then it's compromised. System does not work, right? So you might have seen that sometimes I sign my email. So if you have the right client, you might have seen that I signed with the uh, S mime, right? How many of you noticed that I signed some of my email with uh, mime, right? So so I can sign my my email such that you can verify that it came from me. Right? But it, I'm not saying that only you can read it. Anybody can read it because I'm, I'm signing it with my uh, private key. Right? The opposite problem is if I want only you to read this message, right? I would sign it with your public key. Right? Which means that, which anybody can do. Anybody can sign it in your public key. Which means that only you should be able to Decrypted because you have the other, you only you have the other, other pair, right? So you have both the combinations to get the stuff you want, right? So that way I can ensure that only somebody that I want can read the message. So if I want some message to only go to a specific person or to a whole group, right? I would have to encrypt it on the on the particular key. So if I do both, right? If I encrypt it with my private key and your public key, that means it could only come from me and it could only be read by you, right? So that's the notion of asymmetric gain, and it's, it's pretty popular, you can do a whole, whole lot of stuff. So company RSA basically tries to work with that. Um, how many of you use PGP or public key, private key encryption for email or other, other stuff? You, if, you, if you don't use it, you probably use it when you go to a company, right? So if you want, if you want something 
to to be valid. If you want something to be signed to be, to to make sure it comes from you, right? You would want to do something like PGP or, or, or one of those things, right? And there are, there are a lot of stories of how you know not using PGP, um, what damage it can do, right? So essentially, when I send an email to you, right? Forging email is very easy, right? How many of you take the network class? So if you take network class, you'll probably realize that forging email is is simpler than your project one, right? Not project one, project one, the network class. How many of you know how to forge an email? Only one, two. So if you do a telnet to the mail server, and then you can, if you know how to talk the command, you basically forge the email, right? There are some protections on you know where the IP came from and stuff, but essentially, um, so the server talks to anybody. So if you say I want to send an email to me, right, it'll ask you who are you, and you say my name is blah, right, and it'll take whatever name you type in. There's no restrictions on what you can type in, so you can choose to type in whatever you want. Of course, there are ways. I mean, the, the modern mail servers are a tad bit more. Um, um, complex and that to, to tell me to debug all the stuff to figure out what it is, right? But for the most part, it's up to me to uh, up to me as somebody to check through all the stuff, right? So if I, if I get a mail from one of you and and it talks about your grades or something, I'm not going to check these things. So so it's, it's easy to fake those things, right? But the damage it can cause is, is tremendous because I, usually you check the who the message is from and then you go with it, right? So how many of you actually Verify the messages from me before you act on it, right? So if I send a mail saying their homework is extended till tomorrow, right? Anybody could have forged it, and I won't even know because I don't get a copy of my same email, right? And in, in the class setting is fine because I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. But in in a, in a company setting, it's going to be bad, right? So one of the the classic example I I look at is so in the internet, the domain administry, right? You can send an email to say. Um, to change who the administrator is and all those things, right? So AOL, AOL's um, DNS record expired, and somebody forged an email saying um, AOL's mail server now is in Taiwan, right? So, which essentially meant that, so since the person did not send it using secure mechanisms, PGP or whatever, the other person saw it, he should have done the checking and stuff, but they didn't. So they just said, okay, fine, you know, just change this stuff, right? So for one morning, like from whenever time to, whenever time that this person came in to did this till like noon or something, nobody in AOL was getting any email, right? But no one actually knew what was happening because the mails were not bouncing. They were actually going to some company in, in Taiwan, right? So it's, you won't know what, what was happening. So that's not a good thing, right? I mean, I'm sure that the person who did this was not rewarded kind of stuff. So, Sort of things you'll 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 probably do when you go more for a job, but essentially that's what you're trying to do, right? And here's the the math behind how how this works. So I didn't tell you how you would choose these keys, right? So you need to choose a key such that you can apply this private and public key in any order to get the message back, and you should not be able to figure out what that message is from the encrypted message. And there's a whole lot of math behind it, and these are the properties that you need, and number theory tells you what algorithms would give you those things, right? And the stronger algorithms take a lot more longer to compute, right? So if you choose a very strong encryption, then it, it's safer, but it also takes you longer. So depending on, so if I'm sending a mail to the class, I don't want it to be as strong as if the president sends a message to all the troops, right? So you, you want to base it on what the message is trying to be. So I think the book, book talks about one of the algorithms on how you do that, right? Um, so the, the essential thing is the symmetric key is, uh, algorithm is, is pretty, pretty uh, fast, but you have to worry about how to distribute the keys. The public key, private key is slower, but the, the public key is known to everybody, or at least there should exist a mechanism for everybody to know my public key. So um, it's slower, but the key distribution is, is simpler because it, it, there's a public component that everybody should know about. 
in the symmetric key, if anybody knows my pa key, my password, the system is broken, right? Whereas here, it's only broken if you know my private key, not my public key, right? So the, the notion of authentication is trying to figure out who you are, who you are, right? And this is one of the things that you will use all the time in your, in your system, right? So can you think of one, one time where you authenticate yourself, where you tell the system you are who you are? When do you do that in a, in a typical system? Yeah, when you log in, you authenticate, right? How do you how do you authenticate usually? Pa yeah, you enter your password, right? So your password is is some sort of a token that you have, and the system figures out does does something to see if you're the right person, and and then it authenticates you, right? So the system has to know who you are, so it has to know whether you have the right right token, right? So if your password is something, right? let's say your password is blah, right? So what would the system store in order to see whether you're the right person, right? It has to know whether that if you give, if you say blah, it knows you're the right person, right? It means that it should know that the real password is blah, right? So it has to store it somewhere. If it stores it on the real machine, then somebody who cracked into the machine can know all the passwords, right? So real machines don't do that. They don't want to store the real password. They want to store something where it can use it to verify who you are, but not actually know what your password is, right? The way you do that is through um, what is called ha hashing, right? So essentially, hashing is a mechanism. I'm going to go through the, these things quickly because you know the the details are are way beyond the scope of, of, of what what you're trying to do right so the idea of hashing is if you take a message if i do a hash i come up with a smaller message right and a good hash is one where i can it's i, I do it one way only right i can take a message i can hash it and i get something else a signature right and you want the message to be a, a bigger size than the hash, right? You want the hash, you want it not to be able to go back. You don't want it to go from the hash <coughs> to figure out what the password is. You don't want any hint, hint on what the message, what the original password was by looking at the hash. And you don't want collisions, right? You might have learned from the algorithms class, if, you, if you're hashing, if you're making a larger message into a smaller message, there will be collisions, right? It, it's possible that two messages would map to the same thing, right? Because information theory would say that it has to happen because it's you're going from a larger space to a smaller space, right? So you want this to be less uh, less likely, right? Because otherwise, th there are two or three passwords which can uh, authenticate to the same thing. So essentially, what your system would do is it'll take your password, use some sort of hashing algorithms, and store the hash, right? And the hash can actually be given to anybody, so it's, it's not any secret, right? So if you give a new password, it'll run it through the same algorithm again to see if it gets the same hash. Right? That's one of the system reasons why you can't recover your password on, 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 on a machine, right? Because nobody knows what the password is. Everybody knows what the hash is, but the hash is only good for you to retype the password. So you need to reset it, but not know what the password is. And there are a whole bunch of different algorithms. You, know, you might have heard of MD5, SHA1, all those things. You might have seen it when you're doing uh, when, you're, when you're downloading packages, right? You know they, they check to see <coughs> who you know what's the what the signature or if somebody has modified it by doing a hash, right? So if I give you a program, I can give you a program and say run this program, or I can say here's a program and here's the hash of it, right? So if anybody were to modify this message, only I could have created the the right hash, right? Only I know how to create this hash. So if I can keep these things two separately, right? Obviously, you don't want them on the same machine because then somebody can steal the object and then change the hash, right? So if I tell you in, in class that I'm going to send you a program tomorrow, right? And the hash of that would be one, right? Then I can actually don't have to worry about the security of the program because if anybody modifies the program and you check the hash, it'll, it won't be one, right? So you don't know who modified it, but you know it's not me, right? And that's one of the ways that OS implements some of the stuff. You know, it tries to verify that the object is, is who it, it says it is, right? 
Um, and the other notion of, of how this goes is the, the digital signatures, right? So if you're downloading your applets or something, it has a notion of a signature. So, it, so you, you see something which pops up and says, this is a signature that is signed by somebody, right? If you're downloading a patch from uh, Microsoft, it checks to see if it it's really came from Microsoft by checking signatures, right? So the idea there is Microsoft would, so you go with the asymmetric key, right? And you have a notion of 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 a of a trusted chain. So there are some some companies which are deemed to be trustworthy. So for example, the company like Verisign, right? So essentially, what Microsoft does is it 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 hard codes the fact that Verisign is trusted into all the systems that they sell, right? So if you want to be want your program to be trusted and you don't want to give these keys, right? You have to go to Verisign. You have to prove who you are, right? And you trust that Verisign will do a good job of verifying who you are and giving you a key. So they will create some sort of a, sign, a, a, a key which is countersigned by you, right? Essentially, they, it's countersigned by their um, public key, sorry, the, the private key, right? So they take a certifi electronic certificate, they sign it with their um, private key, and then give it to you, right? Since you are programmed to know what the public key is, you can use their public key to figure out what they said. So you know it only came from Verisign, and you know you trust Verisign because they are they are deemed to be uh, trustworthy, right? So what Microsoft would do is hard code the fact that Verisign is to be trusted, and every time they write a program, they go to Verisign, and hopefully Verisign would do some kind of a checking to see this is a good piece of private code can be trusted, and then they countersign it, right? So your program, your, your system would not implement, would not install a new driver if it doesn't have a signature, right? And that's that's one way to protect your machine because now if you can, so now you're creating a chain of stuff. You know, you're saying, I want to install a new operating system, but the operating system was trusted by Verisign, right? I, I, I trust Verisign. Since Verisign says trust Microsoft, and since Microsoft says trust Apple, I trust this program, right? And that's sort of what you do when you when you download your code, and that's one way to patch and apply stuff to your machine because you you have all this trust going through, right? So what's the problem with with this approach? What what can you think of a problem with, with doing this stuff? Yeah. Now, if someone gets a hold of the private certificate that Microsoft has, or someone can somehow crack the. Yeah. So then then you then you're really in bad shape, right? If, if somebody uh, gets, yeah, if somebody gets hold of very same key, then a whole bunch of stuff is uh, cracked, right? So that's why very same machines are not in a network, right? They're not in a network, they're inside a safe vault and stuff, so they're not going anywhere, right? And hopefully Microsoft would, would treat it the same way, you know, not put it on the web or whatever, right? So that's one thing, right? The other other stuff is all of you trust very same, right? And how many of you have heard of very same? Oh, that's pretty good, right? Many, many people have never heard of Verisign because they don't actually look through all the stuff, right? So magically they trust Verisign because, so it's a kind of chicken egg farm, right? Microsoft says trust Verisign and they put that into their OS and all the software is trusted by Verisign kind of stuff, right? There's no reason to believe that they are doing anything bad, but it's a chicken and egg farm. And that brings up the issue of trusted computing base, which is not, not really here, right? You can only build the security based on something that you can trust, right? You can't build something secure without trusting anything, right? You have to trust the hardware, you have to trust OS, you have to trust something. And there are all these little things that you have to trust, and your system will be more secure if you keep that list to a small number, right? If you're really paranoid, you can think about what somebody can do. They can put, like, plugs in your machine and, you know, get all the signals out, because in your memory, all of them are unencrypted, right? So the one way to figure out what's happening is by looking at the memory directly, not through the systems, right? So you have to have some kind of a trust, right? You have to assume that people don't have access to go into the room, right? So physical security is just as important. So the, um, the Notre Dame payroll machines, right? It's, no, they won't let, so if you say, oh, I don't want to log in, but I just want to open the box and put some pins into it to see what, what's going on, right? Hopefully you won't go too far. But if you can go too far, then all the stuff we talked about here have no significance because somebody can directly read what's in the contents, right? 
And the other notion with all the stuff is the notion of revocation, right? Where it's all well and good, but sometimes you have to take stuff back, right? So as long as you're inside Notre Dame, we trust you. But once you leave, right, we need to be able to revoke your key. So if you sign some document after you leave the, like in, in this class, right? So if you leave the class and then you sign some document, then I can't <coughs> trust you. I can only trust you as a student, but not as a, as a student in this particular class and so on. Right? So you need to build this notion of revocation and stuff. So all the stuff we kind of breeze through in like half an hour would be the focus of many classes, you know, uh, later on, right? And key distribution is the, is the main thing which, which holds all of these things back. Key distribution and, and managing these keys is the, is the whole, whole thing, right? So I would really like my file system to be encrypted using a very hard to guess password on a massively high strength that nobody else can break it, right? But uh, then I have to trust that everything works because if something happens and I lose the key, then I'm host, right? Because I made it so strong that no one can read the content, right? So you want the ability to be able to retrieve the key, right? Just to, just in case you lose it, right? Sort of like what you do for your home, home, uh, home things, right? You don't build a house house with only one key. You make another copy, give it to your friend or, or somebody, right? And people like it if it's a friend. People don't like it if it's the NSA which has the other key or. or uh, or stuff like that. So you, you might have read people complaining about government being able to figure out what, what's in the, you know, what, what the contents is by having a secret access door and stuff, right? And how do you balance those is, is, is still hotly debated, right? So if I, I buy an encrypting file system from Apple, I would like to know who has access to those, right? I would like to have access to my, myself, and depending on what I'm trying to do, who has access and what they do and stuff. Again, it's the problem of managing keys, who has access to it, who should have access, who should have the keys to it, and it's not a trivial task, right? So once those are not solved, implementing it on your local, uh, on your laptops is not going too far because I have to have a way of saying sort of like what your house, house stuff is, right? If you, if you lose your keys, you can go to the locksmith and get it open. You don't want, it, want a case where they say, you lost your password, Tough luck, I mean, just start all over again, right? Um, and I actually talked about the digital certificate notion, where it's, it's signed by somebody. Um, I'm going to skip over the SSL, which is one of the hybrid mechanisms which, which do both, right? Hi, SSL actually uses symmetric key for transmission and asymmetric key for um, to figure out what the symmetric key is. Right? So it gets the best of both worlds. Um, so it actually uses the asymmetric key to send you, so once it chooses the symmetric key, sends it over the other side using asymm asymmetric encryption, and then they use a the symmetric key. So you get the good performance and the benefits of, of both. Right? It has problems and stuff, and I think I'm gonna skip that. We talked about passwords and um, how you do that. Right? I'm just going to skip through these things because it's it's it's. Um, and it, you have the notion of a firewall where you can you can say only what should go in, what what can't go in, right? And I want to add one more stuff which is not in your in your uh, book, which is the notion of moving the firewall notions into the operating system, right? So you can actually make your operating system a little bit more complex, where you can firewall off components that it's not supposed to uh, use, right? And actually, your Linux machines do that. And this is the one of the things that spoiled very many of you in the first homework project. Remember, you had to set enforcing equals off to boot up, right? So the, the way it was set up, it's sub, set to be enforcing such that processors cannot access something that they can't access, have access to, right? So your web server cannot just access any files. It can only access certain files, depending on some policy, right? So when you have built a kernel, you didn't build this policy file, and that's why it was failing. And you 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 solved it by saying enforcing equals off, basically make, making the machine open, right? It got a homework project done, but it made the machine highly um, highly unsafe, right? And so that was a form of a, a firewall for the operating system, where the system was trying to ensure that only only you have access to what you're supposed to have, 
not just everything, right? And you had to break it to make the project work. So there's a notion of like security levels, and I think the, the Department of Defense maintains a list of um, what the security levels, and you can you can pay uh, and to have it have your OSI validated to be on on different levels. So the 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 highest stuff you can get is the A level uh, A, A grade security, right? Which means that you can formally prove the system is secure. And there are very few systems which reach that level, right? The the immediate parent of Unix was at the B level. I forget whether it's B1 or B2 or something. Um, and I think Windows NT is at the at the C level, right? It provides mechanisms to audit and, 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 and do protection and stuff. And so essentially you can you can put your operating system in any one of those, go through the certification, and that gives you a sense of how strong or how weak a particular operating system is, right? And it's also the case the the higher you go, right, the more complicated it is to get it, and typically you don't put them on the network, right? It's kinda of hard to put a system on the network and still formally prove that it's it's secure, right? because essentially then you have to show that buffer overflow and all cannot happen, all those things. So as you go further and further, the system becomes harder and harder to use because it's so secure that it has to deny a whole bunch of stuff, right? So desktops would probably be D or below, <coughs> but from the defense perspective, they would want something higher. And so Windows Windows um, Windows XP, for example, pro, you know uses a notion of when you when you go into the machine, you have a notion of authenticating, right? You you first log in with a password, and it it'll do a whole bunch of different ways to authenticate. It can go to um, Kerberos or some network mechanism or something local, right? In, in case of Notre Dame, like this machine would lo log in over the network to some some place, and so once I log in, I have a token which I can pass to other processes to get my stuff done. So essentially, I have this token, so every process I run, every data I, I, I open, gets access to this token, not by you doing exp anything explicitly, but the OS knows that. So OS knows that in your process control block, in your login, it associates that security with you. So every process you invoke, every time you do a fork or any of the processes, any of the system issues, it has to check to see if you, are, you have privilege to do that, and it all happens transparently, right? So all the mechanisms we talked about before would have to be <coughs> augmented with the notion of do you have the privileges to do what you're trying to do? And it's all tied to your password that you log in, right? And the password does not have to be typed in. It could be a smart card or, or what have you. Essentially, that's how they tie it in with the, within the uh, Windows 60. We'll see a little bit more of that when we talk about it uh, in the last the one for the last test. So that's about it, and I'll, I'll send you a mail from the weekend on what I think is a typical laptop, so we can we start thinking about how we would uh, tune operations for that particular machine. Right. So I'll see you on Monday.